the first step I, I think um, with the sexual addiction it starts first with the uh, with a porn addiction um, and I think mm -hmm. for a lot of men it kind of starts there and that behavior is uh, normalized in the community um, and that started for uh, for me around age 10 I was kind of introduced to uh, pornography um, by one of my older cousins and uh, from that point uh, by the age of 13, 14, I had lost my virginity. So it kind of accelerated that uh, way sooner than what it should have. Um, and from that point between maybe by age 15, 16, I uh, had probably a full out porn addiction where. Um, so 16. So somewhere around there. Yep. Yeah, right, right around that, like in the middle of high school, you kind of did discover yourself after uh, after sex, kind of discover yourself, wanting to educate yourself. You think that, like I said, this is introduced by an older cousin, but in most homes- When you say, I'm sorry. So when you say it was introduced by an older cousin, he just said, look at this porn. I mean, because think about it. 16 year old boys are all horny. Like, you know, I mean, how do you differentiate? I mean, I was in school and they were like, pop your bras and jump under you. And, you know, so how do you, at that point, no, it was an addiction. Was it just consuming you? Because some of the stuff I read, it was like, it literally consumed you where you just had no, like, it was like a list of things that happen with people where it's like, you just are consumed with it. Like you don't do anything else in life, right? Well, it, it definitely can evolve to that point. Uh, from the, one of the courses that I teach in my church is a, it's a conquer series and he's a, he's a doctor. And so it's interesting. It, a lot of his, he connects uh, as a Christian based Christian based program. He connects uh, God with um, some of the physical parts of it, and then the brain, the the, the mm -hmm. uh, that part of it. And so, um, some of it is just a callous behavior. And what I found out in all of it was that was my way of uh, medicating. So uh, mm -hmm. self, uh, yeah, just self medicating. You are sixteen. They introduced you to it. You started what? Watching age, porn, was, obsessed with it, or? So at age 10, I was introduced to it. Didn't really know what it was, but kind of just like, what is this? And mm -hmm. uh, like I said, by age 14, I had 13 or 14, I lost my virginity. So I was kind of introduced to sex early, earlier than, it, than I should have. And uh, from that point, from being introduced to sexual intercourse until 15 or 16 kind of liking that feeling and not really knowing what it's doing at that point it wasn't an all-day thing but um it was happening more than what it should watching porn and, and uh, masturbation and trying to i guess you would say discovering yourself yes. or myself um and from liking that feeling but what i learned through this program um use it was used kind of as a coping mechanism so Okay. If it got too hard, or if I was actually stressed, or if, like you said, I, I didn't have a lot of big T's, uh, like traumas, uh, a little, they call them little T's, small T's. And I think that that was my way of medicating through some of the things uh, that you deal with and try to figure out in high school. Whereas, so you were going through typical high school stuff, say whatever, and then you would go masturbate or watch pornography or have sex, and that would be your way of feeling better about yourself? Or were you feeling okay. depressed? Or how was it a medication? Like, how did that make you feel better unless you were going through something that it had to make you feel better? Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, right. Well, that that's where I mean the little T's. I think I was trying to, okay. yeah, it wasn't, I didn't have per se a normal childhood. Um, okay. and I don't know a normal childhood is, but yeah, I was exposed to some, uh, some different environments. Um, my, my family worked in the entertainment business, so uh, I was exposed to some interesting people, interesting concepts, uh, and I, I traveled a lot. Mm. Um, it, it, I'm not going to say I didn't have a stable home life. We all worked together as a family, but I, I, it just wasn't normal for maybe a high school student trying to figure out all the things and um, in life and puberty. And, um, you know, a, a, another huge part of this addiction, both pornography and sexual addiction is the community and the home life that you come up in um, when it's normalized. And if you have no one to talk to you about, hey, 
this is not the right thing to do. This is not the, not the right way to handle this behavior or what you're experiencing. But there's no one educated enough or uh, just familiar enough to speak life into it or kind of point yeah. in the right direction or tell you, hey, this is what you're dealing with. Um, yeah, because it's a stigma and you and then fact that we don't talk about this stuff, right? Like I'm just now researching it. I'm 50 some years old and I wouldn't have, if I didn't have a show and you weren't talking about it. So think about that. Right. And so now you're 16, you go to college or, you know, we're far oh, away from where you are now. So this oh, journey is like, well, what yeah. does it look like? This is why I'm starting there. Just so you can understand that, Ooh, that is, this is what's frustrating uh, about this whole thing. Uh, the enemy, it, they put, so so one of the more famous sites, uh, they, they've been on the record saying, a, 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 from one of the pornography sites, uh, a 10 or 11 year old customer is a customer for life. So that's kind of how they are positioning themselves in this ecosystem. So wow. what happens is, that like with me, the hooks got in early and I teach a group. We went around the room. Everybody's probably out of six or seven guys have been introduced around 10, 11, 12 to wow. something. Well, I mean, of course, with the internet now and, you know, no regulations. I mean, there you go. So and, 18, and, you're at 18. So, you're at yeah, so, so undergrad was, it was awful. Yeah. That, that was just, uh, that's where it just full blown turned into uh, a, uh, just a, a full blown porn and sex addiction. And it was uh, obviously no regulations that, that, uh, I went to a state school, that environment, it's just, it's open for that. No one's trying to regulate having a premarital sex or talking life about any of it. It's just, a, it's, it's, it's a wild place. Um, and it just went, uh, things definitely, that's where things progress. Okay. Uh, so I'm sorry and, to cut you off. So yes. you had a porn addiction. Yes. When, when I did the research, sex addiction leads to porn addiction, or was it porn addiction? <laughs> I have to wait for that. The other way around. The other way okay. around. So porn addiction leads to sex addiction. So you were you having a lot of sex? Were you sexually active? Were you promiscuous? Or was the sex I, included or just the obsession with porn? Uh, it was just uh, porn at first. Just watching the porn over and over again. And masturbation. Yes. Masturbation. Got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And what I learned from where we are now, uh, it, it from the the brain, it creates like a grooves. And I, I don't know the brain terminology. I think that some of the doctors and everyone else will speak to this, but it, it right. creates pathways in the brain. Mm -hmm. And that's why I speak about callous behavior. So uh, at any point, rocky emotionally, or something happens, the brain, the grooves are already set for that behavior. Okay. And it's kind of like a a gateway. I'm not going to say it is that for every man or for every person, but if you consume yourself with that type of material and that type of that visual, eventually, I mean, that's where your brain's going to go to. You're okay. going to shift towards that. And so, um, yes, that's that's where the behavior became callous was an undergrad. So from 17, mm -hmm. 22, 23. Uh, so graduated with a degree. Wow. College football, everything was amendable with that. Yes. Which tells you that it is something else, you know, because I hear a lot with people who excel, but then they have this other thing going on. So it probably showed your spirit or something was leading you to just continue. And you had a, for this unfortunate situation. So I want to kind of start to bring your wife into the conversation, if you don't mind, because um her sitting there and supporting you is the most beautiful sight. Um, and I just am blown away that you can get past this and you can get the distinction and differentiation and know that it was something. So tell me, like, of course, when you met him, girl, you were like, oh, he cute. He's so nice. You know, and you didn't know this. Right. <laughs> Look at him blushing. So then tell me about, you know, your love story first. And then like when you first found out, like, oh, there's something else going on here. Right. Um, yes. So um, when I met him, of course, I had all of those feelings. Like, <laughs> um, I did see something deeper going on. I didn't know how to pinpoint it. Um, he he kept a lot of our conversations and his emotions like really on the surface. And that is like a big sign that 
your husband or spouse could be struggling with a porn or sex addiction, they struggle with um, expressing feelings, getting deep into conversation. So I did notice that, like I wanted to get to know him deeper and deeper and he kind of just kept me right where he wanted, wanted me. Mm -hmm. um, so we struggled a lot with that. And um, before we were married, I um, actually saw on his tablet, you know, porn. Okay. And um, he blew it off like, you know, oh, it's just. I'll, I'll guys that watch again. porn. I mean, yeah, I'll never do that again. I was just right. being selfish. I'm busy. He traveled a lot. I mean, just traveled almost every weekend. Sometimes he would be gone two weeks at a time. Sometimes he would come home for a day and then leave. So that was his life. Um, so he was able to do that um, a lot. And, um, you know, the excuses at first. Uh, and I kind of just, honestly, I was just like, it hurt when I saw it. But I'm just like, I told him, I said, please don't do that again. Like, just So you were, you were upset about the porn? Yes. Because most guys got porn. I got, I dated guys that have like a whole collection of Vanessa Del Rio, like yeah. bought it well, off of eBay. Like was, so what was so. Well, little did I know that it's, it's, it's horrible. It is. I'm just going to say it like porn is horrible. So, um, then there's so many reasons why it's horrible, but, um, I blew it off because like you just said, Hey, that's what guys yeah. have. Um, I, I have like brothers you. and you know, I'm, yeah. I grew up, grew up around guys. I heard guy talk. So whatever. I'm like, whatever. So we got married um, and things were just kind of funky between us. Um, mm. Just on the surface. Emotionally. Yeah. Emotionally. Just like on the surface conversations. He really because you were not. Why? Because like you weren't really on, like you said, you blew it off, but it was really, was it affecting you in a way like your own? How did that happen? Well, no, with, so well, with him, I just didn't feel connected to him. And okay. usually, usually someone who's struggling with that addiction, they cannot connect with their, their own feelings. So how can they really give you anything in return? Yeah. Um, so but you guys got married. Yes, we and did. So, so if you got married, he was, he was fell in love. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, for sure. But yeah. it was just that you just didn't feel like, you know, that women intuition at deep, connection you didn't feel that it was something you i just, just knew something spirit. was something, I knew something was going on and shortly after we got married um he actually admitted to me i was doing mm. we got into a big argument before he went to europe this was like the breaking point okay he was going to europe for work and um when he got out there like that whole week before he left we did not speak to each other like we were just mad and i couldn't even tell you why we were mad at each other we couldn't even tell each other we're just like what's wrong with us so um, when he got to Europe, I was just, I, I was upset. I'm just like, man, we can't keep going like this. Like what's going on with us? And I was reading a Bible devotion and the, the, the devotion was actually about a man who said he knew that he needed to confess to his wife that he had a porn addiction. Mm. So when I read it, I'm like, huh, something, you know, something told me, send it to Lester. So I sent it to him. Five minutes later, he texts me like, I need to talk. Wow. Well, that just gave me chills. Yeah. So God so was already kind of like intervening and trying yeah. to get him to come clean with what was yeah. going on. And he, he, when you sent it, were you like, oh God, oh God. <sighs> like, was um, I knew it. Was no, afraid? I had a peace over me. I was yeah. calm. And I said, he said, well, I need to call you. And I said, no, just tell me. I said, just text it. Cause okay. I already knew at that point. I'm like, just text it. Yeah. Um, and we went, you know, from there, of course, when you go through this in your marriage at first, unfortunately, um, and he'll tell you, you know, yeah. there's a lot of lying in the beginning, like, oh, it was just porn. Um, and then if you find out strip clubs, oh, it was just strip clubs. Okay. So it was like lie after lie after lie after lie. Oh. Um, and finally, we got to this point where he sat down one night and I looked at him. It was like 12 midnight. I said, listen, tell me every, I want to know everything that you've done. I know yeah. that you've done things with women. I just had it on my spirit. I knew that there was wow. going on. He started to gain weight. Um, he was mm -hmm. eating sweets almost every night. He had to have like a beer, just a beer. Like he had to have one beer every night and like chocolate or some type of candy. Hmm. And I'm like, this is weird behavior, like out of nowhere. It's almost like he was trying to, I don't know, soothe himself. I don't know, like chocolate and beer. I mean, so he, I don't so. Know. So he was sleeping with other women too. Oh yes, he did. He confessed that it was. Um, he confessed. He told you everything. 
And so how, yeah. how did you handle that? I mean, Alexa, like that's, I mean, you're uh, sitting here, of course, now, but at that moment, I've been there. My ex, I don't want to say who he was. He cheated on me 19 times. He was going to swinger parties. He was, people thought we were swingers because I started to watch him kiss women at events and I would look the other way just because I knew he had a childhood trauma and I kept saying, well, you know, he's over-sexualized. That's just him. But it was affecting my mental stability. Like it yeah. had to have, how did that affect your own mental health? How did you handle um, that? Because Well, um, you know, God prepared me for this um, in my childhood because my um, father had a drug addiction and my mom mm. was a stripper. Okay. So um, I had a very traumatic childhood um, and I'm actually getting help now for it. Okay. So when this happened, I wasn't, I was blown away. And when he told me everything, I was um, numb. I couldn't eat the next day. I couldn't even take care of my kids. I told my, my in-laws, like, you got to take them. I can't think, can't eat, can't do anything. Can't well, how long were you guys married at this time when this all came out? This was like, cause you got yeah. kids at this point, happy yeah. family. 2016 September 2016 so no it was 2017 so you had been together how long before this whole thing oh, came not out? even a full year wow and yeah. so did you think at that time like you you right now you know we can talk about how you guys fought in in your in this in your ministry but then did you like my marriage is over this guy's cheating I'm out of here but you immediately was like tell me about like how did you transition to here? from like finding out not only is it a sex addiction, he's saying from 16, how do you know that's a sex addiction? First of all, like, cause in no way I'm just going to be like, Oh, I have a sex addiction. I'm sorry. And I'll be like, Oh yeah. Bye. You know what I'm saying? Well, um, you... because he couldn't stop. Um, mm. Couldn't stop. And he told me that he, he's like, I, I need to get, home. I can't keep living this way. And we went through a really, really, ugly process to get to this point. I mean, we went through it. I, I mean, it's almost like a movie, how everything happened on the ups and downs. I mean, it was, it was scary. We wanted to get a divorce. Um, we were going to get a divorce. Um, it was, it was not easy at all. It was hard. Of course. And, and we needed, we did have support along the way because you can't keep this stuff just in your home. That is dangerous. Because yeah, you need other people Covering for him, and you need safe people you could talk to. Yeah. You go to counseling, you need support groups, you need all the help you can get. Um, but yes, we went through a lot of um ugliness, and um, we were going to do a full disclosure with our counselor, uh, and it ended up COVID. um, well, COVID. yeah, COVID hit, but yeah. uh, he went to Japan this let what was it? Um, no, 20, yes, the end of 2019. So it was like New Year's Eve mm -hmm. in Japan. I was pregnant with our third and we were getting ready for our disclosure with our counselor. So that's when he tells me everything that he's ever done. And then he takes a lie detector test. Mm. And he Girl, wrote, he went all the way to a lie detector test. Well, we, it, yes, they do this because it's putting everything out on the table. Okay. And then there's a lie detector test to say, Hey, I'm serious. And I'm telling the truth. Like it's a okay. way of showing way of comforting yes. you and just, this is it. Once I'm going to let it out, it's got to all. Yes. And it's kind of like a starting over point for us. So then he would write, then he writes a letter to me, you know, about how sorry he is. And then I write a letter back saying like how I felt from everything. Our counselors are there with us yeah. to walk through it. It's a really, um, it's a big process, but we didn't get to that because when he went to Japan, um, I knew again, which throughout our relationship, I've always kind of like the Holy Spirit nudging at me, like yeah. something like, right? Uh, um, I went through his email when he was in Japan and actually oh. found the disclosure. And that's when I read that it was everything that he did. And at it that was point- more than you thought at this point. When you read the disclaimer, it was like, holy F. Yeah. So um, how bad did it actually get? Like how many, what was it? I don't even, the, the, I can't even. Incalculable, right? Like, yeah, it was pretty much the same stuff. Strip clubs, sex with other women, porn. But it was just reading all of that on a piece of paper or just yeah. in that email was like, 
you know, it, it was like, whoa. So yeah. um, at that point, you know, I was pregnant and oh, I was like, no, I don't want to do this anymore. I just want to get a divorce. And he was like, yeah, let's get a divorce. He was feeling hopeless. I was feeling hopeless, mm. feeling shameful. Of course. Um, and I was, I just didn't even, there were times I was like, I just don't even want to live anymore. Like, God, why would you give me oh, a wow. life that has an addiction? And I already went through this throughout my whole life. But, you know, it's it's made me stronger, of course. Yes. And um, God God told me specifically one night to stay. I actually mm -hmm. had a dream about Lester one night when we were separated. And um, he was sleeping in his, he was sleeping in our old home by himself. And there were um, these like creatures just all around him. Just, just growling all around and just big. Wow. And then there was like this big devil in the corner mm. and Lester was sleeping there with his eyes closed peacefully. Mm. And I woke up and that's when I heard God say, I, you're not going to go anywhere. You're going to stay because I'm going to help you I'm gonna do to save this man's life. And that's why you're here because he was going down a really dark path and, and this sex addiction and porn yeah. Take men down a very, very dark path. It does. Wow. I mean, I was married to a man just like this. And now I'm thinking to myself, I have to rethink this. And I'm glad we're having the show because, <laughs> because, you know, I, oh my goodness. So I, I want to bring in, cause I, you know, I'm getting, I'm sorry, getting a little choked up. And then mm -hmm. I got to bring in the people that know the stuff, the brain and everything, because we got to get into, <laughs> the the fundamentals of this now that you've shared it now let's go into how you endured and and i want to bring a really powerful couple on uh wes and nisha string fellow they're a husband and wife duo who have been married 33 years they are pastors directors of heart life ministries certified life coaches marriage counselors authors and advocates for strong healthy marriages they have counseled countless couples through crisis and are passionate about assisting couples in overcoming the challenges that adversely affect their marriage. Mm -hmm. Nisha is also a certified leadership coach who helps businesses grow through networks through her business development company. So that's Nisha's network. So welcome to the show. I want to bring on Wes and Nisha. How are you guys? Thanks for waiting in the back. I had to just get all the info. I'm blown away talking about this because like you heard earlier, I think that is my journey. And for Lester and Alexa to come on here and just tell their truth, just so she just, you know, that the spirit is leading her because she's really helping just me. So I can imagine how many other people she will help. So I don't know how you guys want to weigh in, but I know you have years of experience. I know you've been listening. So, you know, how can you weigh in? I'm going to let the experts take over on, you know, talking to them about this journey. Wow. So first, I just want to applaud Lester and Alexis because it, it takes a whole lot of bravery to even fess up to something like that. Then it takes an even stronger woman to be obedient enough. When I say obedient, that she was obedient to what God was saying because she could have just packed up and left and Lester could have been left there hopeless, you know, on the same path. You know, so first of all, kudos to you guys. Um, I think some of the things that you guys um, are saying and have done and that you shared are exactly what couples need to know. Um, and I, I, I am sorry that you guys had to go through this, but there is purpose. And there probably will be hundreds of couples. Thousands. Thousands even <laughs> that will benefit and be able to, will be set free just because of your testimony. So thank you for going through it for thousands of couples. Um, and even listening to Miss Allison, you know, it, it's it's a lot of times we hear if I had only heard somebody or if there was all any if there was somebody for me that could have told me this story, maybe things could have turned out different. Yeah. And I want to add that um, the healing process is really it could be very difficult, but it's it's the hardest part to say yes to the healing process. It's the hardest part to say I'm going to go once you say yes to the go. Um, it makes it a little bit easier, especially if there's uh, you both are, have the power of agreement. And so mm -hmm. just from you all, it, it all starts with the root. 
And I love that um, Lester spoke about the root of where it started. When you introduce, and sometimes couples are not willing to go back to the root. A lot of times it's hard enough to admit the wrong, but then really doing the work to say, where did this start? Where did this door open that caused havoc with me first? Because you think it's just your spouse, but it's not. It happens with you first as an individual. And then the toxicity continues and it bleeds on into your marriage, your work life, your children. We always tell couples that um, if you if you don't do it for anybody else, you and hubby and wife might be okay. And you may heal, mm -hmm. you may work through this, but it will fester into your seed if you don't heal wow. and if you do not begin to uh, seek out the counsel. So sometimes mm -hmm. you have to fight for more than just yourself for yes. each other, but fight for generations to come. And I thank God Ooh. that, uh, the Troutmans are also, uh, you all have uh, kicked the devil's butt, basically. Yes. A generation, you know, mm. the stories you all write, the books you all will write, the, the, the you all get chills. Oh, my goodness. Will yeah. make such a world of difference to bring change to lives everywhere. And the children, that's the thing. The devil don't care about me and Wes. They don't care about y'all. He cares about what's coming in front the of us. Seed. So that's what's so profound. So the shift comes with your admitting, owning, and then being able to say, I'm willing to get the help that we need. Wow. Um, if you guys want to call in, of course, the number is 708-545-2446, 708-545-2446. Just if you have a question or if you just want to weigh in and just give a little pound out to our, your brother right here. Um, uh, to Wes and Nisha and all your experience, I'm sure you've seen and heard just about everything. And when you talk about infidelity and the difference between a cheater and someone with an actual addiction like this, you know, what do you tell them or, or in your in your experience? How does that pan out? Because like me, I, I need to go make a couple of phone calls. <laughs> well, correct. First, um, I think the first thing and they did the exact right thing is you need to get some individual counseling. Mm. because it is it is not your spouse's fault it's not because she's like or less than it's not because alexis isn't beautiful or wasn't everything that that lester needed that wasn't the reason there was something a seed that was planted way back when he was 10 years old and that seed grew and grew and grew so now once you realize this now you need to get your individual counseling and and it and I'll say this, when, when they say it takes two, you cannot do it by yourself. It takes a supportive spouse. And we always talk about being that safe place. Um, and Alexis may not have felt like she was that safe place when she got <laughs> the wind knocked out of her when she yeah. first heard this. But as the journey goes on, there are going to be struggles. There are going to be things that come up. And if your wife or your husband, because it can go either way, believe it or not, if they are that safe place where, hey, babe, I'm struggling. Um, I, I, I had some thoughts or I was looking at something and it just kind of led, you know, I need you to pray with me or whatever that is that you need. Um, them being that safe place will keep you on that even plane. And I'm going to just add that that doesn't mean you're like, oh, baby, let me be your safe place. Mm -hmm. Come in here and tell me every little thing. No, that's not what it's going to be cracked up to be. There are going to be some sleepless nights. There's going to be some frustrations. There's going to be some um, intense fellowship between you because it's not easy for the spouse to hear, here we go again. And we right. get these calls all the time. But one of the biggest things you could do is accountability. How often do you check in on your spouse before the, mm. the situation comes up? I love that Alexa said, the Holy Spirit, Yes. Her. So God is not going to let you go unnoticed. And I know I could share this a little bit. Um, some of the people we've talked to, they have accountability. They have actual alerts on each other's phones that if the pornography, yeah. anything surfaces, the wife or the husband gets an alert and it's not to go and attack them, but it's to say, hey, I see you're That's struggling or even paying attention to different patterns. I know when Wes is struggling with, with anything, like, so your heart should beat as one. So Holy Spirit be like, have you checked on Wes? And I'll call him right at the right time at work. Hey, mm. everything okay? How you know to call me right now? I don't know. I just was feeling you. So it's not just in the lovely moments you're feeling each other. It's in those moments where you know each other are going to struggle. 
and you're going to have those moments. And, and Alexa and uh, uh, Lester, Lester should say, you know, babe, how are you feeling sometimes? You know, mm -hmm. is everything good? You know, you feeling safe? You know, um, thank you. Every now and then a thank you for mm -hmm. sticking it out with me. Kudos to you. But having right. that accountability is so huge to not be alone and other partners uh -huh. in ministry or whatever, uh -huh. uh, friends that will hold you accountable. Lester, you want you you wanted to say something, I think. You did something. She said something. You went, woo. You and you look at Alexa with so much love. I'm watching you guys. There's so much. I mean, Wes Nisha, I know you guys see it. It's just the way he looks at you, girl. Oh. But you wanted to say something. Okay? That, that's a struggle. Okay. And that's a struggle too, going through this journey. Um, uh, and what what uh Nisha was saying is we have boundaries set. So Lester oh, has, and this is this is how I knew that we were. Oh, okay, go. No, I, I, not to cut her off. Just the, the 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 guys need to understand. Like she came with the boundaries, and uh, once we got deeper in this understanding, they were the right boundaries. And so the, my phone is completely uh, locked down. I guess through Apple, they have something where uh, that kind of content can't come on the phone whatsoever. Wow. Uh, uh, so uh, GPS, like tracking stuff, and we have accountability software. His so, location is on his phone at all times. So, so, and trust me, I grew up. I mean, I uh, other married couples, other single, like man, that's crazy. You locked down, and, and that's the lot of enemy plants. Mm. And because what that, without that, we don't get to this point today. So even through my frustration, not wanting to do it, the resistance in the beginning. That is what ultimately that was like the baby step of the beginning of getting to where it's no longer even uh, a thought per se. And the devices are the devices are not uh, a distraction, but it took a while to, to, to build that up. But the initial they like, you just Nisha rolled it off her tongue. Like it was easy. It's, it, it was not that easy for me to that do that. Mm -hmm. But without that. that and that's how, beginning. you know, too, if um that was a sign for me. I can't speak up for anyone else, but that was a sign for me because I would come with the boundaries because we were going through that. I was going through that with my counselor. She's like, you have the right to set boundaries, healthy, safe boundaries. And when I would come with the boundaries, he would fight me like, no, no, I'm not doing that. Or he'll just toss the phone like whatever. And he wouldn't really cooperate with me. Um, and then some stuff would be turned off. But when we got to the point where he said, here, take it. Do what, take all my devices and do whatever you need to do with them. That's when I was like, whoa, like he's serious, you know? And that was a big sign um, when he, for me to know that he was ready and that he was really serious about at least wanting to change. Because I do want to say something when you're going through this journey uh, with porn addiction and sex addiction, relapses are real. I, we're not sitting here and saying like, wow. we'll, we'll never go through anything else again. And, and we know that. And, and we both take it day by day. We have, he has his own routine. I have my routine. We both do our work on our ends, um, weekly check-ins help. Um, like Nisha said, and, um, we have covenant eyes, which is a program where you could put on your phone and computer to help, uh, to help you have accountability okay. partners. You can have your friends be your accountability partner if you're single or you're parents or whoever, and they'll get notifications. If you are looking at something, you could talk about it with them. So oh, we have so many different things. We don't even, I know this is extreme and we have lost friends. I was just going to say, cause I asked that at the beginning, how many friends have you lost? We don't like, go to best, bars. Cause you know, friends. your girlfriends are like, girl, you doing the most honey. I ain't going to be with no man. And I got to check his phone every day. Da, da, da. And he's like, Oh, you don't like that. You know that too. Cause yeah, Wes and Isha, you guys have to know like, how, I'm just blown away. Like, how do you normalize this stuff and make it be like, this is real. This is a, and I, we're going to bring Dr. Gettings on because she's going to talk about the whole brain and there's a science, you know, the medical stuff, but just normal people. This is a lot. It's yeah. Crazy. I want to, I wanted to add real quick. Um, and then I, I want Wes to share about before Dr. Gettings comes about the uh, brain, um, you know, the chemical thing, but I wanted yeah. to say this, 
Um, because we are faith-based and we're unapologetically Christians and believers, there's a surrender you have to have to God and not to just your spouse. Because mm. if you're surrendering to your spouse, you will fail every time. Mm. And we're going to fail with God. So why, if we fail mm. God, how much more are we going to fail each other, right? Wow. But the truth is, is that that has to be a daily dying to say, today I'm making a choice to choose what you have for me and your be God's best for me. And I think that that's the key point when that change, when you turn over that phone, you're not turning it over to Alexa. Wes is not turned over to me. I'm not turning over to him. Okay. I'm turning it over to say, I surrender my Amen. will against my own will. Yes. Oh, that was so, that was so perfectly said. Oh, Lester. Say no, I just want to oh. add that, like, that's a- uh, Woo! <laughs> That was that's, a sermon. <laughs> exactly. That's uh, that's the one thing we we uh, mm. uh we didn't add or didn't speak on. I mean, without God, mm. without His Word, without that's that was the beginning of the change for me mm. and in my heart and the, the what propped up and kept Alexa up. That that I mean, a lot of people won't speak about, but that's one hundred percent. You can't do it without God. Yes. And even for a, the person who's been betrayed, so the so the betrayed person like me. You have to be willing to allow God to search your heart to do a work in you. And that's what helped me heal because I was praying for Lester, like, God, change him, fix him. He's hurting me. He did this, 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 and this. Why are you just letting this happen? And God's like, no, 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 no. I want to search your heart. I want you to change. I'm like, me? I need to change? But as I started changing and getting closer to God and surrendering my life, it's like the work he was doing in me was leaking off into him. Oh my God. It was just Beautiful. unexplainable. <laughs> Woo. Okay. I, I feel like I'm in counseling right now. I don't even know. Am I doing a show? I don't even know where I'm at on the, I'm sitting here like in my own time. My producer's probably back there going, what's she doing? What's she doing? <laughs> I am literally inspired. Like this is life changing for me. I mean, I got to get on both of y'all programs, but <laughs> I'm going to bring in Dr. Gettings because I need to take a little, like I need a, oh, I need some water. Um, Dr. Gettings, oh, I'm so glad you're here because I need to take a deep breath. You know my journey. I am blown away right now because I'm rethinking everything because like he had so much porn in his phone. So it, it was identical, Alexa. And I didn't have the knowledge and the wherewithal that you have now. And God used you. And I am just, woo, okay. Anyway, Dr. Gettys, as you know, is our in-house psychologist for the Brain Truth. She is our brain gang member. And she's here always every week after we're talking about these incredible topics to kind of give it some type of foundational, you know, information to kind of tell us what is the brain doing? What is happening here? Yes. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I have been backstage listening to... This wonderful conversation, Allison, this is one for the books for sure. Because okay. I Woo. think that we touched on so much. I want to start with um, what Lester was saying just about childhood exposure. Um, because when we look at brain development and the impacts that early childhood exposure to pornography, um, explicit sexual content, how that can shape development, and increase an individual's risk for addictive behaviors. And when you look at just statistics, Lester kind of hit all those marks. He was exposed early, that led to sexual behavior early in adolescence. And then by undergrad, you know, it was just completely out of control. So what I really want people to understand is that our brain is responsible for so much. It is one of the most dynamic organs in the body. And a lot of us don't get a lot of information about how to develop a normal, healthy brain. And so, as he mentioned, a lot of things that we're exposed to, depending on who your parents are, what they do for a living, if they're in entertainment, could easily be normalized. We know that when it comes to hypersexual behaviors, it's oftentimes more normalized for men. Um, but these are conversations that we have to have. I'm a child psychiatrist. And so I see children and adolescents every day whose parents bring them in for help because they have discovered that they have been exposed to porn. They usually see signs like isolation, uh, signs of depression, and sometimes 
the porn addiction doesn't come out right away, but it is something that's unveiled later on through the therapeutic process. Um, I do want to speak to what we refer to as porn addiction in the medical community. Um, it's referred to as compulsive sexual behavior disorder. And it's actually going to be in the ICD-11, which comes out next year, which is the International Classification of Diseases. So we recognize that this is a growing problem and it's becoming a recognized diagnosis and treatment plans are being developed in order to help individuals overcome this problem. And when we, Allison, you had mentioned earlier, like, okay, well, how do we know it's an addiction versus just cheating versus right. this, right? Like, so whenever you use the word disorder, it has negatively impacted you personally, socially, professionally. It is a problem. This is not the same thing as someone who cheats. This is a okay. addiction. This is a compulsive behavior. It's repetitive. Mm. You can't just stop. And why does it happen when we look at our brains and how they function? And Lester already mentioned this earlier, when you look at neural pathways. So when you start to expose your, your brain to the reward stimuli, right? There are certain things that cause our brain to have a reward response. And mm. that reward response results in a release of dopamine, which allows us to have these pleasant emotions. And so when right. you look at the reward system, the main things are food, water, and sex. And if you think about it, these are the things that we need in order to survive, right? Because if you don't um, have something that's wired in there to make you pursue those things, you're not going to reproduce and you're going to die from starvation. So it's mm. really that simple. Those are your hardwired, instinctive uh, reward system basics. But on top of that, you also have what's called the prefrontal cortex. That's the part of your brain that's there to say, no, that probably isn't something that we need to do right now. No, maybe we should put the brakes on that. And so what we see with addiction is that pathway that is responsible for reward and the emotional response, the amygdala. When you look at functional MRIs and people who have these addictions, that pathway has developed astronomically. Are and you the serious? Oh, so serious. And the prefrontal cortex, the pathways to it are totally diminished. So you, you gradually lose your natural ability for self-control, controlling impulses. It starts off impulsive wow. and then it graduates to compulsive. But how does that develop? Like when you say an MRI can actually identify, so how does it actually, are you born with this? Does it like what? So when you look at people who are more prone to addiction versus others, right? There are a mm -hmm. lot of studies that look at their reward system circuitry. And look this up, guys. It's the mesolimbic system and the nucleus accumbens. That's we type that in. Them are some big doctor words. We need to do. We what we gonna do with them words? <laughs> can, <laughs> can Stephanie or somebody just put it up later? I don't know. We'll put it up later. Just, just we'll, we're gonna do a follow up video. But yes, mind, think about it this way: your brain is responsible for a lot. Emotional processing is responsible for movement. It's responsible for thinking and planning. It's responsible for your sleep wake cycle. Like it is right. doing it all. Okay. Yeah. And if you overly um, consume or become compulsive in any type of activity, right, you can start to see what's called neural changes. The pathways change. You can strengthen certain pathways. You can weaken certain pathways. It's really mm -hmm. like um, if you don't use it, you lose it. Right. So he basically overly exposed himself for years and years and years to this reward circuitry. Right. He okay. said it started off with looking at porn and masturbation. Well, what does masturbation lead to? release of dopamine, right? So it becomes a coping mechanism. It becomes your go-to. It becomes you really literally chasing a high. And it's the same type of reward circuitry that we see in other addictions, whether it be uh, people who abuse cocaine, heroin, alcohol, gambling, you name it. All of those individuals are struggling with a compulsive need to keep this reward on repeat. OK, and to your point, there are studies that show that people who are more prone to addiction or people who have more addictive 
uh, addiction in their family history. Okay. From a neural developmental standpoint, there are studies that show that their reward system functions differently. They have more of a hypersensitivity to that reward that comes. Got so, it. But the longer you feed it, the more it grows. Yeah. And so it becomes virtually impossible to just stop on your own. Um, many people are helpless in this journey without the help and support of loved ones and professionals. Yeah, that's what they said. So, Absolutely. so let uh, Alexa uh, and Lester, is this something that you've heard before? Are you mind blown or did you know about all this or, you know? So it's interesting. Yes, to me, uh, one of the series that you teach called Conquer Series, uh, he breaks down everything she just said. And I, uh, I don't think that though, that, the general public understands that it's, okay. it's very, like they show the MRI scans where uh, did you get an MRI scan? You got oh, one? I did. <laughs> I did. Go get get an MRI. I, I did <laughs> not for your friends. All them t- people talking that smickety smack. Go <laughs> get that MRI. No, I, I did. I just it, it showed a brain scan of someone addicted to a pornography and sex, and that of a, a cocaine addict in the prefrontal cortex. Wow. It, it was lit up the same way and. Uh, it was just completely worn down. And wow. Yes, it, it, this is so I think even for her, it began to help with her uh once she was had access to seeing some of this information in this in this series mm-hmm. that uh like oh it's it's much more going on as well. It's not uh, just them just doing it or him just doing it because he just wants to hurt me or like right. Uh, Wes said it's not because I'm not beautiful enough or right. not good enough in bed right. or whatever. It's right. Because it's, yeah, this is so, an addiction. Yeah, I'm oh, yeah. 34, so at 10, that's 24 years. Like, prior to this coming out, it's 20-something years consecutively of just pressing on that dopamine button and continuously going. Wes and Nisha, yeah. how do y'all, okay, so you got couples that come in here with the same thing. Do you immediately say, oh, I'm going to need y'all to go get an MRI? I mean, how do you mix <laughs> The science no, with the spiritual, um, this is a lot. You know what I mean? Like, hold up now. I'm sorry, y'all. So, I'm just being real. How do you I, handle this with all this information? Because this is real and this could help so many people. This is such a common issue. Yeah. So what, one of the things I, I always like to explain is exactly what Dr. Gating said. I explain how the dopamine fires in the same things that fire off when you are doing cocaine, mm-hmm. your brain looks exactly the same. It's the same things. Um, mm. And it, one of the things that we tell couples, along with counseling and all that they need, um, one of the practices that I tell them is you need to rewire your brain, just like Dr. Gating said. So when you're um, being intimate and you're at that moment of climax, if at all, try to have that eye to eye contact because it rewires the brain because now that dopamine I'm getting is my spouse and I'm not, I don't have my eyes closed and got a movie in my head or whatever I saw (laughs) last night on the phone, you know, this is my dopamine right here and it helps rewire the brain. Um, And that's just a little practice that you can do um, while you're going through the process. Um, You know, go ahead. (laughs) <laughs> I wanted to say um, that when when Lester and I would be intimate before I knew that he had this problem, and maybe this is more spiritual than um, science, but when we were when we would be intimate, I would imagine him being with someone else and not me. And I kept having these visions when while we were intimate, and that was actually something that started messing with my anxiety and those things. And I had to learn how to re- rewire my brain as well to get all that trauma and negativity out of my head, just like he had to do it for him. So there was like a lot of things in our brain that we didn't even realize that we had to rewire and um, try to fix those grooves that are that were in uh, our brains. The wife, she, she needs to know that it's not her fault Mm-hmm. Your husband needs to know, don't be ashamed that you're not alone. Mm. And if you can get past those two things, then you begin can begin that journey of healing um, and doing whatever it takes. Um, and what you said about the phone, and I'm going to tell you, this is for somebody. When you 
when you are really serious, just like you said, and you are really trying to get to that point, you will you will say, baby, here, take my phone, check my computer, <laughs> do whatever you need Ooh. to do. But when you're not serious and you know the men are not serious, I'm like, yeah. man, I'm not giving my wife my phone. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Exactly. You know, and, and they feel literally like they're being violated, like they're being, you know, chastised like they're a child, tired. you know, and controlled, you know, and they reject it. And sometimes it doesn't work. And you're on mute, Dr. Gettings. Go ahead. I was just going to add to that piece when you all were describing all of the restrictions, if you will, boundaries that have to be set to make sure a person truly heals and recovers. It very much so still mirrors the tools that we put in place for other addictions. So again, it's decreasing access. It's helping that person get back to a place of that prefrontal cortex controlling their own behavior without needing other people to step in and do it. But those pieces are absolutely crucial to have a chance of getting to that point. And the not personalizing it for the spouses, I think is really key because listening to Lester's story and his journey, all of the things that he's talking about that had, let's say, developed abnormally with his brain based on his story, that was already there when Alexa came along. So it couldn't have had anything to do with her or anybody else that he would have met. She happened to be that person in his space, in that chapter in his life. But that is a huge barrier. A lot of individuals will personalize the behavior. They will make it about them when oftentimes, more than not, this is a problem that showed up before you even got together. Uh, if, if I could add to that real quick, one of the things I thought about was, and we talked about this, is the naked truth. It's so easy when you're intimate and you're making love and all of these things to be naked physically. But how can we begin to be naked at the heart? And that's why they said they had to redo, rewire. We wrote a book called Reboot Your Marriage. When you're starting over, sometimes you have to go back to the very beginning to reset and say, what is the nakedness of the heart? What are you really feeling? And that's what we, we really try to conquer that in premarital because it's so much harder to deal with after you've entered in and you go through that honeymoon phase. And then uh, we're like, who is this person I married? But there's so many things. So we we practice really hard on trying to um, do the make couples do the work. We do the work right with them. Let me just tell y'all, nobody's exempt. It's both it's both sided. So, you know, making them do the work ahead of time so they don't have to do the work three years. You'll still be working. But marriage is not we always say marriage is not hard. People are hard. The stuff we deal with is hard. Marriage could be a piece of cake, but the people <laughs> get past us and the nakedness out of our heart. Yes. That's the hard part. Wow. OK. All right. So. I'm sorry. Go on, Lester. No, I don't have nothing to say. I, I'm running out of time. I'm just sitting here like you. I forget I'm doing a show. I'm like, <laughs> I'm learning so much and growing. Lester, go. Uh, I wanted to add something to Wes about uh, the other side of it for men getting serious. Uh, one of the things that um, we do or that has to happen for recovery to happen or for you to start to uh, reprogram your brain is the materials and the environment that you're putting yourself in has to change. It has to clean up. Mm -hmm. so for me, God put a man in my life that uh, mm -hmm. he was at the beginning of uh, purifying his life. So everything he ate, um, the media he put into his mind, the music, videos, uh, mm -hmm. content he was reading, everything. Is this somebody in your life? Yes, yes. Who, who is that? Can you... Well, his name's Chris. He's a good. He, I met him in one of the programs that my church does that I that I'm teaching now. And okay. I, because early on in that program, God spoke to me to have hey, you're going to be leading this this type of ministry and program. So I'm fine, great. Um, I, I'm I'm going to do that, but I don't believe that there is a, a, a purified man that really can rid itself of all of the things and, and really live a purified life. I didn't believe that, and I met this this man. And he was just speaking to me about, hey, I listen to Christian music now. I don't listen to secular music. It now gives me a headache when I when I hear it. I don't watch R-rated movies. I don't watch movies or, con or uh, uh, media with ex uh, sexually explicit content. <clears throat> I don't. I treat social media a certain kind of way. Mm. And uh, all of those things 
if a man can begin to, to, to start pulling those back, a true change can happen with reprogramming and working out and to, to replace it and to, to use it for positive dopamine, working out, push, pushing your body and, uh, and then reprogramming it with positive reinforcement, stand in the scripture, stand in the word. So everyone, like the, the church will say, they, stay in the word, stay in the Bible, but it's from a biblical standpoint, that's where you need to be. Scientifically, your brain needs to know the word and use his word to help you fight those spiritual battles you're going through. Yes. So it's all connected mm -hmm. without someone just shaming you by saying, read the word. It's really deeper than that. So all of those things are the beginning of, of some little things you can do to kind of begin to change. And, and nobody really wants to make that change. Like I, I don't have, I, I have a social, but it's not, I have a Facebook that's connected to a, a, a business account, but I don't. He do does anything. not have social media anymore. Yeah, I, he, that was a that. trigger. Right. Mm. Not really that, the one we do have, she runs it and uh, all of that stuff, it, it just goes to her, but, but nobody's really willing to change. And then with work, that was a huge trigger. The Lord changed how that needed to happen. Most people will, are not willing to change that. The people that are around, family members, certain conversations, media, music. I love music. I've always worked in the music business. I create you. I do everything with music. I did not. That was the last thing I said. Yeah, there's no way, God, I'm giving up uh, music. Like I'm not. Yeah, I can't do that. I, I love secular music. I love music. I, I I'm not giving it up. And. <laughs> I was introduced to Christian music, gospel music, Christian, hip hop, all these other things that with with the music I like with a positive message. And so all that stuff began to help shift and reprogram my brain collectively. Yes. yes. Um, Rita McGuire had a question. Are there any, that's Dr. Rita McGuire. She's one of our brain gangs. Um, are there any support groups for couples that have recovered? Well, Go ahead, but I could I could just answer that um, we do have communities of support groups. Yes, there are support groups, but one of the best ways to do it is to connect with a marriage ministry, or um, or of course seeing a, a group a group counselor, a therapist. But um, there are support groups definitely, and our our ministry we definitely have people. I, I could think of the countless couples that if someone that may not be our story, the sexual addiction but we will not leave you uh, empty. We will send you to the people that have the expertise or the testimony so that you can overcome and link up with the strength of who has overcome. So um, definitely there are for sure. Yes. So Dr. Gettings, this whole thing, is there medicine? I mean, there's no medicine. <laughs> this is the medicine, right? The, the prayer, I mean, I'm, the, I'm not trying to be funny. Y'all, they laugh at me every I'm I'm being real serious. Like I know the medicine is 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 the spirit and I get all that. But is there is this a real diagnosis? Is this considered mental illness or how do you classify it? Because I said earlier that psychiatrists and, and everybody they it's a contention with this. So how do you are you do you put it in a box or do you kind of like you know what how do we yeah. lead, lead this conversation so if there's anybody watching like me i'm watching this show myself um <laughs> you know and like what do i take away because i really feel like i just learned something and i how do i go back and try to repair and fix and I'm now with this new understanding yes i think that the first thing we have to understand to answer your question is, and also to speak to Dr. Rita's question, there is definitely help. And we have to equip ourselves to be ready to receive that help and really follow through with the recommendations. Um, there are hotlines for individuals that are struggling. There are groups. Um, but aside from that, moving forward in your journey to healing requires you to remove yourself as was already mentioned from people places and things and you have to really be serious about setting those boundaries if i want to quit smoking i'm not going to go to a party where people are smoking if i want to quit drinking i'm not going to hang out at the bar so you 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 have to avoid those triggers and that part um can be very challenging in an ongoing process as far as medicine okay there is one medicine that's commonly prescribed in compulsive uh, sexual behavior disorders. It's known as now Trexone. Um, I've prescribed it to individuals. It, it helps diminish the cravings for not only substances, but also for 
um, activities that, again, result in that reward system firing off, okay? Um, mm -hmm. Does it work by itself to fix everything? Absolutely not. And we know here at The Brain Truth, it's all about the tools in your toolkit. So right. you can consider that one of the tools potentially. Um, I think that what we have to really take a step back and look at is what are we normalizing in society, right? From cell phones to uh, porn at the click of a button. I don't know about you guys. The first time I ever saw porn, I was maybe about 11 at my cousin's house and it was an old VHS stuck deep off in her mama drawer, you know, and now as a mother of four thinking about, oh, well, your kids can just, so now you have the parental controls, you have all this stuff to really keep this in check because we know that it's a problem. And so I think we have to have honest conversations with our children. We need to talk about things early on and we need to figure out what are we normalizing and why? Just like we talked last week about masculinity and what those norms look like. What are right. we teaching young men about what's normal and healthy when it comes to looking at sexual content? So it's, it's, it's so many layers. I think tonight we just kind of scratched the surface. Um, yes. But as far as the debate in the mental health community, I think part of it has been the mental health community identifies addiction. They identify compulsive disorders. So it's really been like, where do we put compulsive sexual behavior disorder? Do we want to classify this as a true addiction? Do we want to classify it as a compulsive disorder? But that is happening. The World Health Organization has recognized it. Like I said, it's going to be in the ICD-11 come 2022. It's not in the DSM-5 as of yet, but I know it's coming. There's so much research, so much acknowledgement. And as we continue to develop things that will increase a person's struggles with self-control, we're going to need it. We're yeah. going to need it because, I mean, it's coming, <laughs> it's coming fast and hard. Yes, yeah. it's coming fast. Well, guys, you know, as usual, we be getting down on the brain truth and the time be going. We can sit here and talk all the time because we. Be, I told y'all this to be a four-hour show. Um, I forgot I was doing a show. So <laughs> I am just so excited about the show tonight. I believe we need to do another part. What do you think, Dr. Gettings? I'm with it. Let's yeah. do it. Yeah. I think that we need to bring some more couples on here. I, I love Wes and Nisha. I think we need to go yes. ahead and give them a brain gang application yes. uh, because, you know, we've got to heal some of these. The COVID, I can't tell you now, when we were in the pandemic, I lost so many friends, couples, divorce went up because of the simple misunderstandings and we do we we're we're in a, a a journey now where we have to start repairing we mm -hmm. have to start repairing we were locked up with these people that we was married to that we really didn't know no and <laughs> we got to start talking about the hard stuff so i want to um first thank you guys for being here i want to talk about lester's story was wonderful but more importantly him and his wife alexa have this incredible company, right? Alexa is the CEO of Alexa Ray Beauty <laughs> and who has sent me some amazing stuff, y'all. Um, I'm so excited about this stuff. I, got, I can't wait to wear this, but she is the owner and that comes, here's the packaging, everybody. Those are all the, where you can get it, but this is the box that it came in. And I've got this, what is this? Like a little, um, I use some of this on my makeup today. Yes. Um, that'll give you a that'll refresh your makeup and give you a dewy finish. It gave me a do. I was real dewy, mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and I can't wait to use this. I'm going to use this later, and then yeah, it'll melt away all the makeup. The dry, the dry eye cream because I have, I do, I suffer from like under here the dryness mm -hmm. and everything. So yep. I'll be using this, but I will tell you though, I do have on the lip gloss, honey. Yeah, but good. <laughs> this <laughs> is it. Felt good going on. I think when I was doing a sound check. Stephanie was like, girl, your lips look nice. And, and I said, Alexa, right, honey? And it's not sticky. It's yeah. not sticky. It's not heavy. I didn't have to like plaster it on. And mm -hmm. guess what, ladies? Mm -hmm. Brain gang, I've yeah. got you guys. <laughs> um, this is the, um, this is, what is it called? Stand out. Stand this out. is the stand out. I, and I got it all for my brain gang. I'll give you one too, Nisha. I don't know if you wear lip Thank gloss, I but do. I got one for you, yes. girl. Thank you. So we all got this, Dr. Rita, Natasha, Stephanie. So I'm going to get this to you. I don't know how I'll give it to Stephanie. Um, so before we go, so 
you put up the stuff about how to reach you. Tell mm -hmm. me, was this birthed out of this? I mean, was this like part of the healing to create these wonderful products and beauty in the new It was. I actually started before I found out everything, but okay. I talked a little bit about my past and childhood, but the things that I've been through throughout my life. Um, I've been in the beauty industry for about 15 years now, since I was like 15. And I love beauty. Um, I'm a cosmetologist. I love to do hair and makeup. And I just loved um, the part about beauty where I could inspire women to yeah. just love who God created them to be. And I saw working in the beauty industry, how uh, it was a commonality for uh, a lot of my clients to say, well, I want to look like her and I want to have like, I want to have this or, oh, I probably can't have my hair color like that because I probably won't look good enough or, you know, all of these um, things that were making them not feel confident in who they were. So I really wanted to create a business or a beauty company that would help inspire women to just be who God created them to be and not feel that pressure yeah. of the beauty world. And really it comes from my own story because all the things that I've been through in my life uh, really made me feel insecure about myself. I had really bad skin. I don't know if it was okay. from the stress or from just hormones or just Your bad skin. Your skin is beautiful. Oh, thank you. It's, it's cleared up a lot. Um, I had bad skin from 15 to 30, or no, not 30, sorry, 27. I had really bad acne where I would like talk to people like this to try to mm. cover it up. Mm. Um, so I was, I was self-conscious about it. And I just wanted to inspire women through my products and just be a different kind of light in the beauty industry. Um, I have some hair products. They're natural, made with organic ingredients. Um, and it's exciting because I work with a black lab, a black chemist that actually. Wow. Yes. That, I thought that was. Well, you know, that's how I saw your products. That's how this all kicked off. Like I've got bonus yeah. after bonus, but I saw it on Facebook and I'm like, oh my God. And you are so beautiful. And so I started looking at it and then I'm like, wait a minute, Marnie's in these pictures. <laughs> and so I know Marnie Robinson. She is an incredible dynamic woman, a uh, woman of God. Uh, mm -hmm. She's like my sister. I've known her for many years and it was just so beautiful how just the, the divine connection that we're having here. Mm -hmm. um, so kudos. I don't know if you're watching. Mm -hmm. I love you, Marnie. Thank you so much for bringing awareness to this and these incredible, this incredible couple and these beautiful products. So I want to thank you because you did gift us with these products. And mm -hmm. I really want you to put that back up, Jesse, because I saw somebody was that my sister C Lynn. I don't know. And then I saw Dr. Rita said she wanted something. So please, alexaraybeauty.com, please get these products. I'm not kidding you. I feel this is beautiful. The stuff I spray, you know, I'm allergic to a lot of stuff. I wasn't sneezing. It didn't burn. It literally like neutralized my makeup. Yeah, it's I think sensitive skin too. I, I had really yeah. bad sensitive skin. I tried everything. I, I worked for Sephora. I was a beauty educator with them. And I had my hands on all the products. So I knew products and ingredients and and there was nothing that could work for my skin. So I just feel so blessed. Kudos, kudos. So last words for you, Lester, Alexa, I want you guys to give some parting words. Like, let us hear the takeaway. Why did you come? And then Dr. Gettings, I want you to go. And then I want to close out um, the show with Wes and Nisha. And then uh, Jesse put up how we can get in contact with Wes and Nisha, because I know they also have a ministry as well. So yeah. I want that to go up later, but okay. <laughs> All right, Les and Alexa. Um, takeaways. <laughs> the, it's so many, but I would say the biggest one is is you have to get in line with, with God and with the Lord mm. and his word. I mean, that that's the one thing that turned my heart around when I was in the most darkest uh loneliest place and still even to this day has, has been fundamental in us getting to this point so probably the biggest takeaway i i know it sounds easy basic but but that's going to be the starting point um to immerse yourself in this word and for me uh for someone who's in my shoes who's been hurt i would say you, you have to be willing to do the work to heal. You're not going to heal because your husband is healing or you can't wait for him to want to heal. You can't uh, sit around and just uh, feel sorry for yourself. You have to want to heal. It takes work. 
it's not easy. Um, and also I would want, I want to say another takeaway is that um, there is hope whether your marriage make it makes it or if it doesn't. Um, there is hope really. And like he said, with God, you can do it. It sounds easy, but um, yeah, you need God through this process because it is such a big battle and it's so common and it's just out there in the world everywhere. So you have to be willing to do the work and you need God. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Gettings. Yes. I just want to once again, thank both Lester and Alexa for coming on and helping us to accomplish the goal of removing stigma about talking about different topics related to brain health. One of the reasons why so many people suffer in silence is because we are too ashamed to talk about things that many people are struggling with. And so I want to thank you and just let you know that I appreciate you for coming on and being transparent and sharing with our audience, because this is what the brain truth is all about. And this is what we need to help us to heal on a larger scale. Um, for those who've watched, I want to encourage you to never avoid getting help and speaking your truth because of judgment, right? And make sure that you acknowledge in your journey, what your needs are, the needs of your loved ones, your children, your spouse, and you make that your driving force. <laughs> Thank you. And then that's my mom that's there, Pastor Jeanette Jordan, A Journey to the Cross Ministries. She said, when you do the work, you do the work, honey. And she <laughs> also is a, a marriage counselor as well. Um, also, we removed stigma regarding, what was that? Dr. Rita has something also removing the stigma regarding those with this addiction. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Rita. And so close it out for me, Wes and Nisha. You guys are the pros and um, the new gang, brain gang members okay. we recruited well, you. <laughs> I, I will tell you this. Um, when we, we host a um, an annual uh, marriage getaway. Okay. And some of the most powerful testimonies or what people receive the most is when they're able to hear from another couple. Because when you realize that you're not on an island by yourself and you're not the only one going through the same struggles, and then when you start talking with your brothers and your sisters and you see that their struggles are the same, you know, it gives you encouragement. And now you have a community. Um, so you need to invest in yourself, invest in your marriage. And, uh, and when we say invest, it doesn't mean spend a whole lot of money and do a whole lot of things, but invest your time. Um, be strategic. You have to cut things out. Um, one of the things that my wife, Nisha, she always says um, is when we counsel couples is, is where are you at right now? What what, what state are you in? Or do you have a simple cold? You just need, a, you know, some medication. You just need to rest a little bit. Or do you have COVID and you need to be isolated in ICU? Mm. Where are you? You know, yes. and sometimes you have to realize that. And that's where you, you cut people out. You, it's like, I can't bother with you. I have to cut this out of my life. Um, just like Les was saying, he cut a whole lot of things out of his life because he needed to. Because at the end of the day, none of those people or none of those friends really mean a hill of beans to you and mm. your family. Because the only thing that they need to worry about is them and those four beautiful kids that they're raising. Because that's what matters. Amen. You know, and if and if we continue to let ourselves go down this path of destruction, even with marriages, it doesn't even have to be an addiction. Um, sometimes we have to think about that next generation. You know, because it's not just about us. It's not always about us. It's about that next generation. And, and what are we teaching them? And, you know, and it's about our neighbors and our coworkers. And, you know, mm -hmm. what are they seeing? What are they watching? You know, and we have to be that example and that light to them. Somebody does. Yes. yes. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed by just being here um, with you, Allison, and just uh, Dr. Gettings and Lester and Alexa. Because um, there's the scripture that says in Revelation, we overcome through the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. Mm -hmm. And that's how we overcome. And we don't just overcome with our own story. We overcome with other stories. And so I'm very grateful that even in the uh, part of sitting on the other side of the testimony, it has been transforming. And I just want couples to know that you can transform. There is hope. Yes, you do need to seek wise counsel. Yes, you need to seek professional help. Yes, mm -hmm. medication is necessary. And there is work. And there is work. Mm -hmm. But 
it, the journey, uh, a friend of mine has a quote that says, enjoying the journey in spite of the circumstances. The circumstances may be tough, but you can enjoy the journey. And that is the hope that we have in Christ. So I'm just very grateful to have an opportunity to uh, just connect and be here. We're honored and we're blessed to be a part of this journey and the, the story. It's just been a blessing. Thank you for allowing us to share. Amen. Now you can put up that screen, Jesse, on how we can reach Wes and Nisha. I know that they help a lot of people. They're relationship coaches. Please, they can follow them on Facebook and Instagram at Nisha, Nisha's Network. Nisha's, Nisha's Network. Nisha's Network. And, and, and we'll put this on our, on our website at thebraintruth.com. Also, again, our Brain Gang members are located on thebraintruth.com. If you ever need any of them for keynote speaking, specifically Dr. Gettings is available for speaking engagements for, I mean, she is the bomb. And so is Dr. Rubin. And most of our Brain Gang, you can find them on thebraintruth.com. Uh, so again, this is episode 113. I want to thank you guys for being here. I had a lot of enlightening going on. I've got actual people texting me right now telling me, Dr. Gaines, I'll show you who I need to send this show to. I, yeah. I mean, this was like life changing. So yeah. that's a whole nother show, honey. Um, we want to welcome you back. We'll talk to you. Stephanie, thank you for this incredible show. Again, that was season. Um, we're coming to a season in, guys. Next week is our final show in the Real Man Cry series and the last show of 2021. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. So tune in next week at 7.30 p.m. Central Standard. You can go to thebraintruth.com. Again, this is Allison Jordan with The Brain Truth on intellectualradio.com and iHeartRadio station. And you'll soon find us on 107 VIP and Apple Podcasts. Thank you guys for tuning in and we will see you next week for what yet another episode for The Real Man Cry. Thank you. And again, if anyone you know is struggling with sexual addiction, compulsionsolutions.com. Free yourself from sex addiction, porn obsession, and shame. So please, guys, let's keep this conversation going. Keep holding on to your family and friends and getting them the help they need because, of course, we've been there and we know it way out and you're not alone. Thank you, guys. I love you, Brain Joes. I love you guys.